Hello, I'm Rob Pometeer, one of the co-authors of the textbook Marketing Strategy based on first principles in data analytics. What we're doing in this session is we're going to go through chapter six. We're focused on market principle three, which is that all competitors react, so you must build a sustainable competitive advantage or barriers around your business. This session is around using your offering. There's really three ways in marketing we talk about building sustainable competitive advantage. Brands, which is chapter five, offering, which is chapter six, and chapter seven is using relationships. So using offerings to build sustainable competitive advantage. First, I'll give a little introduction on offerings as a sustainable competitive advantage. And then I'm gonna go through some strategies for both offerings in a big way you get um, sustainable competitive advantage from a new offering is through innovation. So we're gonna speak about innovation a little bit. Marketing really plays two major roles in offerings, is both the development of the innovative offering. So how do you help develop collecting customer information and des helping design the product? You don't actually design it, but the data and the trade-offs. And then we'll go through the launching of new products. And how do you make that product diffuse through the market quickly? After we go through offering and innovation strategies, we'll turn to managing offerings-based sustainable competitive advantage through the steps for doing it, and then the researches approaches for designing and launching. So first, kind of an induction. Developing innovative offering is critical. I kind of want to motivate why spend time in this for a firm's SCA. GE, General Electric, has initiated a camp campaign to initiate 100 imagination breakthrough products. These are not product extensions with minor variation, a little different color, a little different attribute. These are brand new major products. Why do they want to do that? They need to grow revenue and they're a very big company. Product extensions are nice. They're kind of like singles if you look at the, the baseball analogy, just little hits here and there. Imagination breakthrough products are those radical innovations that give you a whole new business. They're like the home run. If you look at Steve Ballmer, the past CEO of Microsoft, innovation is the only way that Microsoft can keep customers happy and competition at bay. Recognizing that in that space, the technology space, innovating in new products is critical to maintaining customer loyalty. Boston Consultant Group, one of the large consultants, consultant companies in the world, argues that innovation is the number one strategic priority at 40% of the companies versus 19% in 2005. This was based on a survey of senior executives. Bain Consultant, another large consulting company, says 86% of senior managers believe that innovation is more important than cost reduction. So and this is common. All these firms or organizations see innovation in new products as key way to build sustainable competitive advantage. However, very often short-term business pressure undermine it. What happens is, a firm is out there trying to develop products, but their performance isn't going well. So ultimately, in order to hit their quarterly earnings target or their annual earnings target, <clears throat> they launch, they cut back on maybe their R&D spending in order to save money. When you don't spend it on R&D, in that quarter, the money drops right to the bottom line, so it increases your profit. So they're able to hit the numbers this quarter, but guess what happens when their products start to become stale? If they haven't invested in R&D, and launching new innovative products, ultimately their product portfolio becomes old. So CEOs typically want returns for marketing in six to 12 months. And new product development often takes three to five years. So that sometimes make a conflict between short-term business pressure, which undermines innovation. Resources can be taken from long-term to hit short-term targets. One of the things that also hurts is often the money spent on innovation, R&D, is seen as an expense today. Even though you're developing those portfolio of new products, they're not seen as an asset. So from an accounting standpoint, they're not getting credit for it until the product's out there generating sales. So let's talk about what is, how, how an innovative offering works. Innovative new offerings help build and maintain SCA and barriers to competitive attacks that arise because competitors are con continually trying to react to a firm's success. So as I said, this is market principle three. Why do we use the term offering rather than product? Offering at times maybe seems a little bit awkward. 
But we do that because we want to make sure that we recognize that it's not just the product that you maybe can touch, the tangible product. It's also the intangible services that go along with the product. Today in the U.S., about 85% of the GMP of the U.S. comes from services. So very often the services that are bundled around a product are more important than the product themselves. So most offerings must be augmented by and linked to brands and relationships to ensure SCA. So what happens when you launch a new product, very often your competitors, once they see that product, immediately start working to copy it. And in some industries, like consumer electronics, six months after you launch a new offering, unless it can be patented, but very often patents can be worked around, your competitors have the offering. So you did all this R&D effort and you only have six months or nine months. If you look at Apple iPhone, smartphone, they came out with a really a revolutionary new product. How long did it take Samsung to copy them? And by some people's argument, there was a period of time that Samsung actually had a better product than iPhone. So iPhone was smart that once they launched it, they knew they had an advantage, but they started building more brands, relationship, ecosystem with services around it, making your, giving you a music library and, and such, and that makes it a lot stickier. It makes customers much more loyal. So next I want to define innovation. So I'm going to try to use the word, before I get any farther, I want, I'm going to try to use the word offering to make sure it's always clear that it's the product and services. Once in a while I might use the word product, but recognize when I say product I also mean the service aspect associated. Now what is innovation? So the definition of innovation is creation of substantial new value for customers and the firm by creatively changing one or more dimensions of the business. There's a couple things about this I want to highlight. First, a few key aspects. It's broader than product or technology. When you think of innovation, don't just think of it's got to be a new product. It can be how you deliver. You know, McDonald's started a drive through They were really one of the very first firms, at least large firms, to have a lot of drive throughs That was a way they were delivering the product. It wasn't a technology, but they added that to, make, after a while, a lot of their competitors. Home Depot, what was their innovation to be a very successful company? Their innovation was the idea that when somebody does a home improvement project, in the past they'd have to go to a lumber store, a hardware store, maybe a plumbing supply house, electrical supply house, to get all the parts they needed to do a, a project at their house. They said, let's put that all in one location and also give people um, some, I don't want to say experts, some people that are knowledgeable to help the consumer shop. So innovations often are in the business process. They can be in many other areas versus just in the product. It must generate new value for the customer and the seller. If you don't generate value for the customer, they're not gonna wanna buy it, they're not gonna wanna buy a premium. But if you generate value and you kinda give it away, the firm won't be able to extract any value in order to invest that in R&D for the next new project. That's typically the argument around pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceutical, it takes maybe 10 years and over a billion dollars to generate a new drug. So they spend a billion dollars over 10 years and they get no return on that money. Then they launch the product. Typically when they launch it, they have a patent on the product and they launch it at a very high price. Sometimes people argue and say, they should, you know, it only cost them a dollar to manufacture that drug after they've invented it. How can they sell that pill for $20? Well, that $19 is rewarding the firm for those 10 years of effort. Because not only does it cost a billion dollars to generate, but one out of three, one out of four are the, are the success rate. So they might spend three or four billion dollars to generate three or four products, and there's only one that's a real home run. If, they, if the government, for instance, said you have to sell that at a buck at their cost, after a period of time, there would be no extra profit to invest back in further R&D to generate new drugs. So you can see there needs to be value for both parties. However, even if you keep the pharmaceutical example, the price has to be balanced. It can't be kind of unfair, if you will. Involves change leading to differentiation in SCA. When you come out with this innovation, you want the innovation to offer some differential advantage to customers, and you want that differential advantage to be sustainable. Some way you can protect it. In the pharmaceutical case, the protection can be with patents. But in very many ca other cases, there's no real way to build a patent around it. 
So typically then you need to brand it or some other way to build it. So you look at like Starbucks, what did they really invent? What was their innovation? The real innovation of Starbucks was recognizing that people wanted a third place to go. Not work, not home, a third place to go during the day. You go there and they want to sit, they maybe want to hang out. Sure, they sell a coffee product, but that experience of buying it. It isn't just, people just don't go to Starbucks very often. Now, today there is some, but just to often buy the coffee and, and run home and drink it. That happens, but initially Starbucks was this location and they spent a lot of time in innovating on how that location should work. Should they have comfortable chairs? Should they have tables so people can work there? They just don't want to turn people through their store. They're fine with people sitting there to a certain extent. What did Dell do? What was Dell's innovation? Dell's innovation was saying one of the down, one of the problems for a computer manufacturer is they constantly change. So if I manufacture a computer like Hewlett Packard, I ship it to my retailers, some store that sells it, Best Buy, Circuit City or something. Soon as I come out with a new brand, a new upgraded model with a faster microprocessor or whatever, all that inventory that's in the supply chain has to get discounted. So there's a lot of wastage, there's a lot of discounting. What Dell found out was, hey, if I sell directly to the consumer and I don't build the product until the consumer orders it and I build it to exactly your specification. And guess what? Dell doesn't even make the computer themselves. They design it, they, man they often outsource it. So they have some third party manufacture it to their spec and ship it to the customer. In that case, they really changed their supply chain. They really changed their supply chain. So what are the benefits of innovation and offer equity? Offering equity refers to the core value and performance of the product or service offered to the customer, absence of any relationship, brand or relationship effect. So if we went back, I gave an example in an earlier session about a beer. If I put a beer in a paper sack and I have you taste the beer, and you say, well, that's pretty good. I'll pay you $5 for that beer. That's the offering. If I pull the bag off, you see the brand, that adds extra value from brand. If it's delivered by your bartender, that adds a relationship. Offering is that core, that base at the bottom. Typically, it has to be good enough. Ideally, it can be even better, and you can bring in new customers, and then build your brand around it or your relationship around that. By building offer equity in an innovative firm can make it more difficult for competitors to encroach. If you look at Apple, keep coming out with new products, that makes it more difficult. If you look at Amazon, Amazon Prime, they keep adding more features to that. That's an innovation. You pay a set fee, you get shipping for free, and they keep adding other things. They give music content, they give TV content, media content. Those are innovations. New offerings often motivate customers to switch. This is probably one of the bigger advantages of an innovative offering. People are kind of habit prone. They're buying, they're using a certain cell phone only when there's some big new advantage. Um, I know many people use Blackberry, myself included, and they were really used to the ball and how it worked. And at first they say, oh, I would never switch. But ultimately the iPhone became so feature laden, so innovative, so much more capabilities that people switch, myself included. So it took an innovative product. I probably wouldn't have switched for just a little minor improvement. It had to be something pretty, pretty different. New offerings can also help a firm acquire new customers or enter new markets um, when they offer a similar performance at a lower price. Sometimes innovations recognized isn't always about added feature. It could be some design that allows you to reduce cost. Offering new and innovative products tends to enhance the firm's brand. So even though we talk about these equities, brand equity, offering equity, relationship equity separately, recognize they pull together. Don't you think the innovative products that came out from Apple helped Apple's brand? Bose, um, speakers and music equipment, don't you think that helps? When they launch that, it actually helps the brand. It makes the brand seem fresh and new. So that's a little bit of the intro of offering. Now we want to go through offering and innovation strategies. We're going to break it into two parts. The first part I'm going to talk about is developing new offerings. How can marketing help develop offerings? There is a technique that most firms use. 
is called a stage gate design review process. The way this works is a bunch of ideas come into the firm. The ideas could come from the engineers, from the marketing department, from customers. So think of it as a big funnel. All these ideas come in. The problem is only a few of those ideas probably can be very good commercial products. What sometimes happens is the firm applies a bunch of engineering resources to every one of those products and the products come to a screeching halt. They barely move through the funnel. So what has been learned over a period of time is that a good way to deal with it is after a short period of time, you have a committee, a group that has R&D, marketing, finance, maybe manufacturing, but they're not people involved in the, um, they're not champions of that product. They're kind of outside observers, if you will. And they evaluate each of those products in the funnel. And they end up only letting a few pass to the next step. This is why it's stage gate. It only lets a few make it through. So based on some criteria, on manufacturability, on, on cost potentially, on customer's acceptance, they let two or three through. Then after a period of time, they do another stage gate. After the products, maybe there's prototypes and they actually test market it and they only let a few of those. By using this process, what they've found is they can make the throughput of new products be much faster, have a higher success rate and be lower cost. So it's a very good process. The big disadvantage of it is it often rejects really, really innovative products. Why? Because at that first review, people say customers don't even want this. Well, they don't want it because they don't know about it. So it's very good for more incremental product improvements. It's not always good for the most innovative product improvements. So this just describes it. a stage gate model divides the development into a series of steps. Each product get evaluated, evaluated on multiple dimensions by independent evaluators. You can't let people involved with the product because once I'm involved with my own product, it's, it's car to mine and of course I'm going to stand up for it. So I'm not very objective evaluating. You need to have independent evaluators. This method helps ensure effective development approaches. So very common way used at most firms, manufacturing product development firms. Okay, there is a technique for repositioning products. Very often there could be a product out there and I want to change this bundle of characteristics and offer it as a fresh new product. Let's go through that. First, what do I mean by repositioning strategy? An innovating offering can result from dramatic repositioning on existing offers, such as removing one feature and adding another and offer a new value proposition. The nice thing about repositioning as an innovation tool, it does not require any new inventions. A common example of this, and there's a, a, a book, a, kind of a popular press book about this, is called Red Ocean versus Blue Ocean Strategies. Let me spend a minute and talk about this. What do I mean by red ocean markets? Red ocean markets are markets usually very similar to what I'm doing today. The metaphor talks about being close to the shoreline. So the shoreline would be not very risky. I can see what's going on. There might even be a lot of blood in the water kind of the red because it's so competitive. It's highly competitive because there's three or four firms all competing. Blue ocean speaks to way out into the deep ocean. It's hard to see, it's very risky, but if you can go develop a product for the blue ocean, you don't have competitors. It almost makes competitors obsolete. So they've talked about this, about repositioning strategies. And let me give some examples. A good example of it would be Circus Soleil. Circus Soleil, who did they go after? They kind of went after a normal circus. There was a circus out there with animals, big name actors, maybe acrobats and trespies. And what they said is, let's pull a couple characteristics out of a typical circus and relaunch it. So they took away the big animals, which are very expensive, they took away the, the high value or the, the big name trapeze argus or anything, and they launched a new product. It was, it had theater-like qualities, it had new music. All the people though, there wasn't any brand name people. They were all, you know, kind of painted so they could replace them and that way they didn't have to have a lot of cost associated with them. And by doing that, they could re-go after the market. Now they repositioned a little bit away from maybe families with a lot of children, at least young children, and they went more to business people, maybe somebody on a date, 
uh, maybe people with older children. So they took this bundle of attributes of a circus, took some of them away. Typically, you take the ones away that, that are very expensive, and they relaunched it, but they added a few new ones. In this case, maybe theor theoretical or um, make it more like a theater. They added music, and they relaunched this product. That would be a repositioning strategy. In this case, um, they were able to generate a new um, target market, if you will. They took a lot of the business from the old circus, but they also added some new customers, and that's often a, a, a way to think of it. Now, an important part of going after the blue ocean, you can't be copying competitors. If you copy competitors, there won't be anything, anything new. Another example of somebody that did this is a Kia furniture store. What a Kia did, typically you go into a, an off, often you go into a furniture store and there's salespeople that run up to you, they say, what do you want? They track you through the store. If you buy something, you say, okay, I'll ship it to you in eight weeks because we have to go make it. A Kia said, no, we're gonna do this different. We're not gonna have salespeople, so they're gonna remove the salespeople. They have checkout people and all, but they don't have people kinda trying to sell you furniture. You kinda go do it on your own. That saves money. They also reduced the number of inventory, made it home assembly, and had it all in stock. So you can walk in, you find your own furniture, you take it home and you assemble it yourself. But you get it very quick. And it's probably at a little different price point because they were able to save money because of inventory cost and salesperson cost. They changed the furniture shopping experience. That repositioned. They didn't copy competitors, they repositioned the furniture. Now, when you come out with a new product like that, you have to think about how to build barriers. Let's just think of some of these. What is Walmart's barrier? Walmart's barrier is, on average, they buy their products about 22% cheaper, their cost structure is about 22% cheaper than their competitors. Why? Because they have so much volume, they don't have that many SKUs, they have a few number of shopkeepers units, they keep their inventory narrow, and they can do that so they buy in volume and get good pricing. FedEx, what is the barrier to FedEx? Well, just think if you wanted to start a new FedEx company, and you say, I'll deliver a product anywhere in the United States in, in, one, in 24 hours. So you get your first customer in Boston and they want to send one to Anchorage, Alaska, but you don't have any other business going to Anchorage, Alaska that day. So what do you do? I mean, it's very hard. Do you get a plane and fly it there? And then you have another customer and they want to go to Oklahoma City from San Francisco. Again, you'd have to, the economies of scale and the barriers to entry are very difficult. FedEx has a whole fleet of planes that go into Memphis every day and transfer. It's very hard to duplicate that once they get up and going. Circus Soleil, you could go in and copy it, but they built a very neat brand around it. FedEx probably not only has economies of scale, but it also has a good brand. And then some companies like Quicken Financial um, Software, once you get it all figured out, it'd be like an online banking or is, is this way too, there's a high switching cost because you've learned how it works, you'd have to go switch. So after you come up with this idea, you have to always think about how can I protect it from people that are gonna copy me. So let's do the red ocean, blue ocean and compare the innovation approach. I don't wanna make people think you should not do red ocean. You have to do some red ocean. Here we're gonna describe it. Classic segmentation targeting position, that's really a red ocean strategy. You go out to your customer, potential customers, you understand what their needs and desires are, you segment them, and then you reposition your product to fit your target segment. It's a known market space, there's competitors, there's industry bounds, product matures, become a commodity, you can manage it, test it, and analyze it. A lot of our analysis tools we go over can be used in this market. Let's think of disruptive position. That's another name for blue ocean strategy, disruptive. It focuses on blue ocean. The market space does not exist. If you look at Cirque du Soleil, there was not any other company out there like Cirque du Soleil. Maybe you could say normal circuses with animals and clowns and acrobats, they were similar, but they weren't identical. There was only some features that were same. Demand is created. So a lot of people that go to Circus Soleil probably would have not gone to Barnum and Bailey Circus. They would have gone out to a bar, a restaurant for dinner, or maybe a theater or something, movie. So very often there's no direct competition in the beginning. But it's often very hard to test. There's not a lot of data. 
and it's high risk. Why? Because if there's nobody else doing it, you don't really know if there's a market for it. You can test market, but you're not sure. So you need to do classic. These are, if you're going back to the baseball analogy, a baseball analogy would say these are your singles. This is getting somebody on first base. It's making money. Very often a firm makes a lot of small growth here. These are opportunities to make large scale growth. It's operating different. Somebody out into the blue ocean. Okay, next we want to understand the effects of new technologies. Everything I spoke about today, so far, the red ocean, blue ocean, did not require a brand new invention. It didn't require something come out from a scientist saying, wow, we can do something now we couldn't do before. Now I want to discuss how to understand new technologies. You can do everything well and still go out of business. Let's look at these companies. Polaroid made, was a leader in, and it was one of the Dow 30 companies, very financially, very successful, and it did film, you know, regular um, photographic film. They miss, missed digital photography. Interesting enough, Eastman Kodak, Polaroid, they both had the same thing happen to them. They were some of the early people to figure out digital photography, but they decided that it wasn't big enough for their business. They wanted to stick to what they were doing and they were used to, very common. Xerox, at one time they said there was no reason that people would want a printer on your desk. They were in the business of selling these big printers that are setting on the hall. Obviously they missed the marker, market that HP went after. DEC, this was probably the worst. The CEO of DEC Computer, which at one time was one of the major computer manufacturers in the US, they said there is no need for individual people to own a personal computer in their home. Wow, was he wrong? Ken Olson. Of course there was, but they didn't see it in the beginning because it isn't clear. So we want to talk about two types of technologies. Sustaining technologies are what you're using now. They might have little changes, little improvements, incremental improvements, whereas disruptive technology is something brand new. At one time, let's look at mainframe computers. For a period of time, anybody who wanted to do big amount of processing would go buy a big mainframe computer. But over time, servers became good enough that you could build a server farm, and both companies like Amazon, Google, they have over a million servers in their server farms. They're very good. They actually, in many ways, they're advantageous over mainframes. But in the beginning, they were not. So how does disruptive technologies work? Typically, they're worse product performance, at least in the near term. But they bring a different value proposition. But one thing that's different is this disruptive technology, while it might not perform very well in the beginning, it improves very quickly. Let me go through an example on this. AT&T provides phone service. Not only in the US, they do a lot of international calls. Voice over internet, Skype, we'll use as an example. When Skype came out for phone calls, AT&T evaluated and said, nobody's gonna buy Skype. The quality is too bad. Very often, voice over internet, Skype, was a disruptive technology, but in the beginning, it wasn't as good. Calls would drop, calls were scratchy. So where did Skype initially take off? It took off people, students calling, international students very often, calling from the US, calling home. Why were they willing to put up with lousy calls, drop calls, scratchy calls, maybe some echoes and delays? Because it was free, and it would be very expensive to call um, using AT&T, for example. But guess what happened to Skype over time? The trajectory of its improvement was better and better and better. And ultimately, Skype got good enough that it took away much of AT&T's business. Where now, you're looking at a large percentage of international calls are being done over voice over internet. So what do we take from this? Sustaining technology very often overshoots what customers need. So if you go back to that AT&T example, they were providing call quality that in many cases was more than people needed. And they gave you um, voicemail, they gave you all these features, and they convinced themselves all these features were required for the market. 
But guess what? Voice over internet was good enough for a part of the market, so it got a toehold. So let's go through this graphic. I think it provides a good example. So what we have here is we have time along the bottom, and this is a lot of this insight is based on work by Christensen, and we have performant features on the y-axis. These two color blues are just a different type of customer. So at this point in time, the light blue is a part of customers that are the low end, the dark blue, and you can see over time, even the low end customers want higher performance. You can almost think of that when electric windows came out on automobiles for the first time, they were a high end feature, only on Cadillacs, BMWs and such. But after a period of time, it went through till now pretty much every car, even low end cars have electric windows. Okay, so if we look at sustaining technology, that's sustaining technology. This technology is well understood. So it goes up kind of gradual, but there's incremental enhancements. So if we want to think of this from the AT&T example, they might add, they might go from analog calls to digital, they might add voicemail, they might add call waiting, caller ID. Those would be all incremental improvements to the sustaining technology. Now disruptive technology, notice that it's much steeper. When it starts in the market, its performance isn't very good. Right here, the performance is low. There's no way the high-end customers are going to buy that. But guess what? Over a period of time, it goes up very, very steep till it ultimately gets into the high-end. And then up here, at this time, it actually performs better than the past technology. The trick is, if you're a Polaroid, and you see digital photography down here, you got to say, that's not where digital photography is always going to be at. If you're a personal computer manufacturer or a mini computer and you're deck and you say, oh, nobody's going to buy those computers and put them on their, on their, in their home. You got to realize the price point might be pretty high at this point, but as time goes on, computers get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Smartphones now are getting less than $150 a piece and they're starting to really penetrate developing countries. Why is that important? Many of the people in developing countries do not have the resources to buy computers, but they have enough money to buy a phone. Very often they buy one phone for a whole small village, and everybody uses that, not only as a library, but to buy things. They buy things online and just ship. So you want to understand that disruptive technology can grow very quick. Here's some examples. Examples, there's really two ways disruptive technologies show up. So if you're a, a mainstream manufacturer or a firm and you're a market share leader, you should be scanning two places to see if there's going to come, somebody's going to enter the market to make you obsolete. One end is going to be the low end of the market. Why did Skype enter with students? Because they were okay with drop calls and scratchy calls and such. Another example is mini steel mills. These mini steel mills, it used to be when you made steel, it took a huge factory, huge. And then you'd have to ship the steel all around the US or the world, as the case may be, from this factory. But Nucor came out with a, mini, a way to make steel in a much smaller factory footprint. But originally, or initially, it wasn't very high quality. So all they made was rebar. Rebar is just the steel you drop in concrete when you make a building, not very needed quality. Then they moved up and they moved up. Over a period of time, ended up now, a new course mini steel mill can make product as, as good as made in a big factory. Vanguard Index Mutual Funds, another innovation, started at the low end of the market. Direct, del, direct to customers, initially smarted at small business and then expanded. But there's another place they can show up which I haven't really spoke of yet. It can also show up in brand new markets. Let's think of an example as the um, transistor. Transistor came out. It was replacing vacuum tubes. However, the transistor did not work as good as a vacuum tube in the beginning. So nobody switched. So the way transistor started, they say, but we have a feature of a transistor that is different than a vacuum tube. A vacuum tape takes a lot of energy and needs to be plugged into an, an AC outlet pretty much. 
whereas a transistor takes very little energy and can be powered by a battery. So they came up with a transistor radio because it took advantage of this battery power and you could take and listen to the ball game or the news in a portable environment. That was where transistors started. So very often new technologies, if they don't start at the low end of the market, they start in a brand new market where the capability of this new technology gives it something that the old technology can't do. Recognize, in all these cases, the new innovation could not compete head to head in the beginning with the sustaining technology. The sustaining technology was too good. Another example of this is eBay. Where did eBay start? It started with like comic books and baseball cards. Why? Because these comic books and baseball cards, they would have to, people that trade those would have to go to like a conference in Vegas once a year or twice a year, and they would all go there in a big conference room, a big conference center, and they would buy and sell. But then what do they do the rest of the year when there's no um, trade show, if you will? Very hard for them to trade. So one of the places that eBay started was in this very small market of quilting, baseball cards, comic books, because it offered it a really key feature. Once they got everything going good, now they moved into many mainstream markets. So typically, the reason new technologies start, and these are disruptive technologies, very different, they start in the low end or they start in the new market because they cannot compete head to head with like an AT&T. Typically, leaders don't incorporate these new sustaining, or these new disruptive technologies because there's a whole bunch of people focused on the old technology. When Eastman Kodak evaluated digital photography very, very early in the life of digital photography, they could have been the leader, but they had a whole bunch of people that had spent 20 or 30 years of their life with photographic film type photography. And they're like, no way this is gonna work because that's all they knew for 20 or 30 years. Typically these disruptive are only accepted by new markets, kind of the prototypical person in the garage. Okay, now I want to sum this together a little bit. Overall, a firm must manage a portfolio of both red ocean and sustaining technologies, and they need to do that because blue ocean disruptive innovations are very risky. If only thing you do is blue ocean disruptive and you don't have one of them hit, you'll very likely go out of business because you don't have enough money to keep you going. So typically you need to manage a portfolio. 60, 70% of your income might be coming from red ocean opportunities. And then you come up for those big growth opportunities like the 100 imagination breakthrough products that GE is looking for to find that next blue ocean or the next disruptive innovation. So typically a firm wants to conduct classical stage STP analysis as described in some of the earlier sessions where you segment the market, you pick a target and you go after it. And you're probably gonna do stage gate design review where you, you look at innovations, you evaluate them, you drop the ones that don't pass the hurdle and you get products out. Lots of product extensions, brand extensions, line extensions. That's what you're probably gonna do for a good portion of your business. Probably 70, 80% of your revenue is gonna come from that. Not very risky, it can be managed but you need to develop a forum and a way to also look at Blue Ocean. Remember, stage gate design review doesn't work very good for the Blue Ocean strategy because they'll reject many of these Blue Ocean as being too risky. You wanna challenge managers to look at these new offerings. Sometimes you can find them by looking at lost customers. Very often people take two or three day offsite meetings and try to think outside the box, if you will, to think of new disruptive innovations or technologies. Sometimes you need to partner to get access to new technologies. Very often firm wants to bring people from outside the industry. Why? Because they don't have, they're not locked in. Potentially if Eastman Kodak brought in some outside people, maybe from Disney or some other venue, they would have said, hey, no, there's a lot of potential on this. We need to go invest in this. Outsiders sometimes don't have the blinders on that people that have been in the same industry for, for many years. But you do want to track disruptive. Companies like Microsoft, they are looking for disruptive technologies. Why? They're going to be looking at the low end of the market. They're going to be looking in new markets. 
to see if there's something coming up that could threaten them. Typically what these big companies do is they have a lot of money, a lot of cash. If they find one of those that are good, then they buy them, they acquire them. In other cases what they do is they start their own little startups. If they come up with an idea they think could be disruptive, they don't try to put it at their corporate headquarters with all the bureaucracy and all. They make a little startup, maybe Silicon Valley or something with a small group of people to try to, to do it in-house. These are some ideas so you can make sure you're going after blue ocean. But I wouldn't want to make anybody think that you, can't, you don't have to also manage your red ocean business. You need to do both. There is a technique that's very, very helpful. Probably one of the top three or four analysis techniques used in marketing that's very helpful for designing new products. It's called conjoint analysis. So what does it do? We know that product superiority drives financial success. It's a very large predictor. If, good to, if you have a new design that's about five times better than the old design, be it price or performance, it diffuses through the market very, very quickly. In other words, you accept, you gain market share. That's like iPhone was able to gain market share because it had a lot of advantages over, let's say, a BlackBerry or other smartphones. But you have to make decisions. And how do you make these decisions? And let me give an example. When you're designing a smartphone, you have to decide how big's the screen. Some people might like big screens. You know if you make the screen too big, it's, it's not a phone anymore. You can't put it in your pocket. It's more into an iPad or something. If you make it too small, people can't even read it. Also, if you make the screen bigger, it takes more battery power, so the batteries will last less. But if you make it too small, people can't maybe watch a movie on it. So there's these trade-offs. If you make a real big screen, it costs more, too. If it costs more, people might not be able to afford it. Um, weight might matter. If you make it too heavy, people don't want to carry it around in their pocket. So there's lots and lots of trade-off when you design a new product. What conjoint analysis does, it allows you, it's a technique for allowing you to understand those trade-offs. So it's a process for determining the unitless trade-off among attributes and set of attributes that maximize appeal. We described this in detail in Data Analysis Technique 6.1, but let me just talk a minute about how it works. It's used for like automobiles. So what it does, I would go out and ask a bunch of people, um, the, the way it works is I would take a car, and let's say there's 50 or 60 attributes on a car. I would take those attributes, I'd build them into conjoint study, I would run that by a number of different potential customers, and after I come back, I could analyze that, and it would tell me, the, we call it the part worth utility, it would tell me the utility of every feature that was in the conjoint analysis. What does that let me do? Then I can run it through a model, it'll tell me the design, it'll tell me the optimal design characteristics to maximize market share for the group of people that took the conjoint survey. So let's think about that. If I could have, I identify this as my target market, I want to go after it for automobiles. I give potential customers in that target market this conjoint survey. When I come back, it'll, it gives me mathematically the ideal product attributes across all 50 attributes so I can maximize market share in that attribute. It's much, much better than an engineer trying to sit there and say, well, should I make it more high performance, but that's going to drive up the cost, or how about the size, gas performance, all those. So it's a very powerful technique for doing this. So what we just completed now we went through an overview in marketing of how to develop innovative offerings. We looked at stage gate design review as a way to do it. We looked at red ocean, blue ocean. We looked at how about brand new technologies. We know that they're sustaining and disruptive. We want to look at low end markets and new markets. And then we saw conjoint analysis as a technique for dealing with that. So next, we're going to turn to the second way marketers deal with innovation and offering and building sustainable event advantage. After the product's design, marketing has to launch it to the market. And one of the most important things when I launch it to the market is how fast it diffuses through a population. So a lot of our strategies are built to make it diffuse faster. Let's think about this. If I'm Apple and I come out with a smartphone and I very slowly diffuse through the market, it gives Samsung lots of time to go back and 
Go into R&D and design a product just like Apple. If Apple only gets 5% of the market before Samsung comes, now for the other 95% of the market, they have to fight. But let's say Apple has a very good strategy and it diffuses through the market and they get 60% of the market before Samsung comes. Well, they can build 60% of the market to be a loyal customer base. Big advantage. So diffusion is very key to launching products. So that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about three ways we can impact diffusion. Psychology, people, and product factors. First, probably no surprise, but many new products fail to meet financial objectives. Some people have quoted 75% of launches end up failing to meet objectives. Typically they meet, they fail to meet objectives for a number of reasons. They might not have a large enough ben benefit. They might have no differential advantage. Why did Bengay aspirin not work? It was really a poor positioning strategy. Aspirin was aspirin and Bengay makes you think of a flavor that maybe you wouldn't want to put in your mouth. Their idea was, oh, but Ben Gay is good at relieving pain and so is aspirin, so they're related, but that's not how the consumer saw it. You might have too high a price versus a performance. A long time ago, Apple came out with a product called Newton. It was kind of the predecessor to the smartphone, but it only did a few things. It was a calculator, it only did a few things, and it was priced at five, six hundred dollars. It wasn't until a decade or so later that they could add enough performance that for five or $600, the product made sense. Sometimes there's just slow diffusion. It's just too slow being launched to the market. Sometimes poor targeting. They came out with a Barbie doll, Ken with an earring, and it wasn't well received. In other words, not many parents bought a Ken Barbie doll with an earring. It wasn't properly positioned probably. Here's another one, one of my favorites. They came out with a new cereal called Breakfast um, breakfast mates. Come to find out, and this is how you buy milk in Europe, you can process milk so it doesn't need to go in the refrigerator. It can sit on the shelf when it's, as long as it's sealed up for years. Once you open it, then you have to put it in the refrigerator. So Kellogg said, geez, we're going to make this cereal and we're going to put the, the box of cereal with the milk and we'll package it together with a spoon and we're going to sell it and it doesn't have to be in the refrigerator. But how they positioned it was if you're in a real hurry on the way to school, you can just give your child this milk and cereal and they can open it up in the car and eat it on the way to school. Do any of you see a problem with putting your five-year-old kid or seven-year-old kid in the back seat with milk? Yeah, no one wanted to have milk in the, in the car. And at home it made no sense because in the America anyway, you're used to having your milk cold. So nobody wanted warm milk on their cereal. So really it was a very poor positioning. Maybe they could sell it if you're going camping or something where there wasn't refrigeration. Maybe that would be a market, but that market probably is too small for them. So lots of reasons products launches fail. Competitive response. This was interesting. VHS and Betamax both came out with a way to have, you know, videotapes for watching movies. They were in a head-to-head -head competition until finally VHS won. Come to find out, technically, Betamax was a little better. But VHS, once they got a large enough market share, consumers had to buy a device that either was a Betamax or a VHS. They couldn't buy one that did both, in most cases. So once VHS became the, the standard, Betamax pretty much went out of business. So what are some psychology that we need to understand about why products are accepted? It really gets to how to persuade people. And I'm just going to go through three of the, the, the big ones. Social proof. Come to find out the way our mind works, we look at what other people do. We look to what others in a ways to determine what to do. We believe if more people are doing something, then we believe it's correct. If the people are more similar to us, it has a larger impact on our behavior. So let's think you're in a new town, you want to buy, you want to have dinner and you're out walking, you're in downtown, you're walking on the street and you see a restaurant with a line. What do you think? And you see a restaurant across the street with nobody in it. Boy, in some ways you should go in the one with nobody in it because you're going to get faster service. But you say no. The social proof shows me that line must mean these people know something and that's going to be better, um, better food. If the people are like you, 
you know, just very quickly, maybe same socioeconomic, whatever, business people traveling, you maybe even have a more um, belief that they're right. That's social proof. Authority. Authority, we also look to say some people are going to be more knowledgeable in certain areas. You might think a professor of marketing knows more about marketing. You might think Tiger Wood knows more about golf clubs. Why do they pay Tiger Woods a lot of money to endorse a golf club? Because people look at it and say, he should know what is a good golf club. There's actually a pretty interesting study done about social, about authority. People look at products to come up with authority too. What they did is they went to a red light in a car. In this case, it was a Ford. And when the light turned, and they had somebody behind them, and when the light turned green, they did not leave. They started a stopwatch. And they waited to see how long it took before the person behind them hit the horn. And they timed that difference. Then they did the same test with a Mercedes. Guess what? People took longer to beep when there was a Mercedes in front of them. Why? Because they gave that person a little more authority because they were in a nicer, more expensive car. So people infer authority from all sorts of areas. Another thing we look at is scarcity. Firms use this all the time. If you feel there's not many left, it forces you to want to buy one now, or if it's hard to get a hold of. They do this on toys at Christmas time. Very often, they ship all the toys to a store, and in the back room of a toy store, there might be 10 boxes of a certain type of, of toy. They tell the toy store, you cannot open the other boxes until we tell you. They open the first box, and it has 20 toys. They set them out there, and people come in, and they do a lot of advertising. They say there's not many toys. People come in, and they stand in line to get the toy, and then they watch the thing. There's only three or four left. People buy it before they run out. In the back room, there's nine more boxes. Very often, they want them to run out for a day before they bring the box out, the next box. Why? Because people come into the store and they say, oh, there's no toys. They've all sold out. Tomorrow, we're going to get a shipment. No, the, the, tomorrow, they're going to open the second box in the door. Honda Odyssey did this. They only put three Honda Odysseys on the show floor so that when you came in, there was not, if there was 50 of them, do you feel motivated to buy a minivan when there's 50? You say, I'll come back next week and think about it. No, they kept them all in LA at the port and they only slowly let them come out. So they made them artificially scarce. Firms do this all the time. It makes you more likely to try something new. There's actually a theory that people won a Nobel Prize on that talks a lot about this. The essence of it, I'm just going to go through one feature of it, is something we call the endowment effect. Come to find out, once you have something, you put more value in it and you don't want to give it up. We don't like to give things up. Come to find out giving up, or negatives if you will, has a much larger impact on our psyche than getting something. For example, if I measured how happy or sad you felt on a scale, and I gave you $200, you would get so much happy out of that, so many units of happiness. But then if tomorrow you got a $200 parking ticket, you get so much negative. Guess what? The negative is always going to be larger for the same dollar amount than the positive, just the way our, we're wired. The evolutionary psychologists have a reason that it's more survivable to put more weight on the negatives. So why is this important for product diffusion and product launch? It's important because of this. If you launch a new product, but you're taking something away, people will, some feature of the product, even if the person doesn't use the feature, they're not going to want this new innovation you have because they had to give something up. So very often when you try to launch something, you want to try to make it where you're not giving anything up because endowment effect show that people do not want to give things up. So those are some ideas about or some ways that we're programmed, our psyche, if you will, our psychology, that are important when you launch a new product to understand why it's accepted. Well, there's another thing that impacts how fast products diffuse. And this is in a book by Jeffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm. What they do is they say, and here's the chasm, is this group, and what they found, and he was a venture capitalist, 
And what he found is a lot of new products would come out and they would grow in sales and they would be funding this new technology. It would grow in sales and then it would all of a sudden drop off a cliff. This is what was happening. There's these people, we call them innovators and early adopters. These are people within any category, be it wine, cars, electronics. There's people out there that really like to be the first to try it. Maybe they're the first to try the new restaurant in town. So what was happening to some of these, these startup firms, they came out in a market, they launched a new product, their sales went up as they sold to these new people, these people that like new things. However, the mainstream market, which we call early majority and late majority, this big part of the market, these people don't just want anything that's new like these group. These people need to have the product with testimonials, they want all the bugs to be out. They never try a beta version. They want the manual. They want all sorts of supporting information to feel comfortable before they buy. So what would happen to these startup companies, they would grow, 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 and they'd crash when they hit the chasm. And that's what this is called the chasm. So what Jeffrey Moore said is, and he has a lot of examples, and there's quite a bit of evidence supporting this, is that Firms down here, when you're selling to early adopters and innovators, you have to work to get all the materials ready for the early majority so you can jump over that chasm and keep your sales growing. And he identified a common mistake that many early adopters did, or many startups did, and this is what they would do. Let's say I have a startup firm, and I can sell my product into five different segments. I can sell it into healthcare, government, financial services, and high tech. If I take my product and I go start selling it in each of these segments, I'm gonna get the early adopters and innovators in each of those segments. So my sales will grow. But the problem is because I, spend, I spread my market resources across five market segments and my R&D group, because every time each of these groups want a little different product. So I tell my R&D group, oh, make this product for this guy. Make this product for this guy. By the time I run out of innovators and early adopters, I haven't, developed any one market to the point that it can go to the early majority. So this is the alternative. The alternative is this. Pick one of these segments that you think is the best, that you're gonna be, that offer the most value, can be most successful, and only sell to that segment in the beginning. Design your product to be perfect for that segment. Divine your market materials, so you have a cattle, you have a handbook, you have an instrument, um, a, a manual. You might even do a lot of advertising to magazines in that segment. So I focus all my marketing researches. So now what happens when I run out of innovators and early adopters in that segment, let's call it healthcare, now I'm ready to sell, sell the early majority. And I'm gonna go up to the early majority because I have testimonials, I have the manual, I have all the things I need. Once I get to the early majority in one market, now I go to the second market and start telling, selling to early adopters and innovators. And I go to the next one and the next one. So the idea is, don't try to just sell at the bottom to everybody. You have to prepare for early majority, early in your, in your um, business plan. So the point here is, people vary on how easy they'll be to adopt a product and what causes them to adopt. These people are very easy to get to adopt. So it's easy to diffuse through these group. These group are much harder. And, um, and you have to manage that. So, so far we've talked about psychological reasons, things like social proof and authority. We just talked about people differences. I'm going to go to the third difference. Sometimes we look at these as the three Ps. The third difference that impacts how fast a product diffusion is things about the product. So we have psychology, people, and product factors. Everett Rogers um, was a person that kind of uncovered this. They found through a whole series of studies that about 40 to, what, 40 to 80 percent of the variation in diffusion can be explained by characteristics of the product. And they identified five factors that determine how fast a product diffuses. One, and changing of any of these five factors will make it potentially diffuse quicker. The five are relative advantage, capability, complexity, trialability and observability. I'm going to go through each one of those. Um, relative advantage. 
Obviously, if your product is better than the competitor's product, it's going to diffuse faster. If I show my product to one of you in the classroom here, and you look at it and you say, wow, that works really good, the person next to you will look at that and say, wow, that looks good, let me buy it, and it'll diffuse quicker. Actually, this is similar to how he found out about these five factors. What they found out is looking at some data on hybrid corn. Come to find out, a salesperson drove across I-60 of the US, and they stopped at farmers' co-ops, and they dropped off these hybrid seed, corn seeds for people to try. Some farmers tried these seeds. They went and planted them in their field, and the seed worked very well. It could withstand bugs. It could withstand moisture variation much better. So this farmer's corn would grow great. Guess what? The farmer in the field next door driving his tractor would look over and say, your corn is great. Mine isn't doing very well. Why is that? They say, I'm using hybrid corn and it diffused. Over a period of years, they watched the hybrid corn diffuse to farmers field by field by field. And that showed how this worked, because that's actually where it started. But anyway, relative advantage captures the economic cost or price advantage of it. But realize, just being better is not sufficient. There's actually a keyboard for English speaking languages that you can, if you learn how to use it, you can type 20% faster than you go on the QWERT kind of QWERTY keyboard. The problem is everybody has a keyboard that's set up a certain way. If your keyboard has the buttons laid out differently, I mean, obviously, if you learned on the old one, it's going to be a problem. But let's say you learn the new one and you're 20% faster, you can't use anybody else's keyboard. And it's interesting, you know why the keyboard's laid out the way it is today? It's laid out because originally typing was done on mechanical typewriters and they needed to spread the letters out so the keys did not get jammed mechanically. So that's how they moved the letters around. Not to be efficient for typing, but so the typewriter did not jam. Well, obviously on an electronic computer it has no meaning, but it's still left over. It's hard to change. So advantage is not necessary. Uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Compatibility. The degree which an offering is perceived as consistent with existing values and experience. If it's consistent with what you're used to, it'll diffuse quicker. Very often you have to break habits. Plastic wine corks. Plastic wine corks work better than real cork. Let's in what oxygen to oxidize the wine. Why don't people use them except in maybe lower end wines? High end wines still don't go. Because you have this custom, this belief that cork is better. TiVo was one of the early recording, digital video recorders. And when they came out, people couldn't use the remote. So they redesigned the remote to make it look like a VCR. Even though with a spinning hard drive, it doesn't go in reverse when you hit the reverse button. But that's how people thought of it because they were used to tapes. So make it compatible, it'll make it diffuse quicker. Third thing is complexity. I think um, complexity, the idea of something's complex, people say, oh, I just don't want to try that. They're learning this in the software adoption space. Very often when you launch a new software, you disable some of the features so it isn't so complex. Only after people get familiar with it do you then you enable those extra features. And people can say, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to look at that. Google was very smart on this. If you go to the Google search screen, what do you see? You see a box to enter the word. Go on Yahoo and look at their search screen. It's cluttered with everything. They kept it simple. People makes it diffuse. People use it quicker. Trial ability. If you can try something, you're more quickly to test it. Free samples, demos, test drives, that's why people do these. If you trial it, it allows the product to diffuse. It renews some of the risk. Observability. There's research that shows things that are in the front of the yard diffuse through a neighborhood quicker than things in the backyard. Why? Because as people drive home and park, they get to see it. And they say, oh, I noticed that new thing you have in your yard. They say, oh, yeah, this is what it does. They say, oh, that's pretty cool. Let me maybe get one, too. So you want your product to be observable. So these five factors, sometimes you have control of them, will allow in product innovation to diffuse quicker. So let's say I was launching the Kindle. The Kindle was Amazon's book reader. Amazon was the world's leader in selling paper books. They came up with the idea of a digital book, or not idea of a digital book, but they had a reader. But I don't think they launched it very well. What they could have done, just think of something like this. It uses a lot of these different things we just learned about. 
Let's say they made a deal with an airline, Delta Airline, to put, to load these Kindles with the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, maybe a couple other magazines, newspapers, whatever. And they gave it for free every morning. They put it in the first class seat. Why would they put it in the first class seat? So that when the people get on the plane, the first class passengers, and sit down, they can open it and they'll look at that the first time they do it. They'll open it and they'll look at maybe the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Who do you think a digital book reader offers a lot of value to? Well, travelers, it offers a lot of value because you don't have to carry the books. You finish a book halfway through your trip, what, you're gonna carry two books? There's a lot of weight, a lot of space. So they're going after somebody with large relative advantage. Second, what is everybody else gonna do when they come on the plane? First class gets on first, they're gonna see the first class people looking at the newspaper on the Kindle. Do you think they have some authority First class passenger? Kind of like the Ford Mercedes example? Sure. Do you think they're going to observe it? Yes. While the first class people are seeing the relative advantage of it and they're doing trial ability, the other passengers are using observability to see it and social proof and authority. Another thing you could do, you could take five more Kindles and you could spread them around the seats in the back of the aircraft. And then you could make an announcement and say, um, Amazon has given us, uh, maybe five is too few, has given us 10 extra Kindles and we've randomly put them in the seats in front of you. So if you want to look and see if you have one, take a look at it. If you like it, look at it. If you're done with it, pass it on to the neighbor next to you. Do you think most of the people will check to see if it's in their seat? Yes. If they do, the ones that don't are going to be like, oh, darn, I didn't get to see it. You made it scarce. That's another one. Again, you're going to have observability and trial ability. Some people will try it. They're going to pass it. So again, you can weave all these together to make your product diffuse quicker. But you have to put them together. So let's think about this. SDP and BOR strategies should be adapted based on the three Ps. Psychology, people, and products. When you segment a market for a new product launch, you might pick your target market a little different. You want to pick your target market where it offers the most value, maybe like first class passengers. You want to look to the low end in the new market for disruptive. If you're a disruptive innovation, you're trying to launch it, look for new markets, look for the low end of the existing market where you don't have to compete head to head. You want to select segments where those five factors are the best because it's going to diffuse quicker and then you can jump to some of the harder to sell to segments later. Positioning, make your offering compatible to existing offerings. If you're selling an electric car, don't make the dashboard completely different than a normal car. Make it similar so it seems easy for people to use. Education and simplicity are key to messaging. Free samples, reduce risk, use warranty and trial periods. Again, these reduce risk and increase diffusion. Testimony, make users visible. You know, if I had a um, selling, let's say, electric cars, if I could give people a discount if they put this magnetic thing on their door saying I'm saving energy by using an electric car, other people would see those electric cars and that would be more visible. That would be an example. I don't know it would be a good one, but it would be an example of visibility. And then you want to do migration strategies. Migration is the idea, go to early adopters and innovators. Those two groups together we often call visionaries. And then we understand how to migrate to pragmatists. What do we need to do those? We need testimonials, we need references. Those are the things the early majority need in order to buy. So we have to think through our migration strategy. That's really market principle two, right? Managing customer dynamics. Targeting and positioning, that's really more um, market principle one. We know there's customer heterogeneity, so we're gonna pick one where diffusion's gonna be quicker. Okay, now that we've kind of finished offering and innovation strategies, I want to move down to managing offering-based sustainable competitive advantage through steps of building and some research approaches. First, the steps. Building offer equity really involves three main steps. You want to develop an offering or an offering portfolio with the largest relative advantage. I mean, that's pretty obvious. You always want to develop a product that has the biggest differential advantage over your competitors. 
Not only will it make it diffuse, but customers will be more excited to switch because there's cost for them to switch. When they switch from a BlackBerry to an iPhone, it's a cost, time, effort, money. So you wanna make as large relative advantage as you can. Pretty straightforward. Second, in line with market principle one, offering actually requires a firm to segment, target, and position the new offering to account for both people and product-based factors. You wanna select people who are most likely to adopt and you're it's gonna be most easy able to jump to the mainstream market. And you wanna pick a segment and target and position the product to take advantage of those five product factors. Third, and associated with market um, principle two, is you have to manage customer migrations from innovators to early adopters. You have to understand that different people across different segments, this customer dynamics as they move into other segments of, of users, they want to have different things. Everybody doesn't want to use a beta version. That's a very special person that wants, is comfortable with no user manual and be a beta version. Most of the people are in the mainstream market. They want it tested. They want testimonials. They want a handbook. So what are some research approaches for designing and launching? Again, typically for a new offering, we would start with qualitative research focus groups. I mentioned Swiffer earlier as an example. The way they found out an idea about Swiffer is they paid some people to put a webcam in their kitchen. Procter & Gamble did. And they watched people mop the floor and clean the kitchen. And they noticed people didn't like to bend over for the bucket and they didn't like to clean the mop. And that gave them an idea. Customers didn't tell them they needed a Swiffer. They saw it by observing. And then they worked backwards to design a product that would solve that latent customer need. Remember, some of these needs the customers don't not know about. Okay. That would be like qualitative research. After you identified, let's say this Swiffer example, you identify that this is a product you're gonna launch, there's gonna be trade-offs in the product. Be it cost, performance, how long it is, does it use water or special mops or whatever. In that case, you find out all the attributes and you do a conjoint analysis with potential targeted customers. That will tell you the optimal design. Why is the optimal design important? That'll give you the largest relative advantage for that target segment, and that will speed product diffusion. It'll also make it a bigger barrier to competitors come out because you have a better design. If you launched it, but the product was good, but not the best, the Me Too guy is probably gonna figure that out and they're gonna have a better product than you. Then the third is something we haven't spoke of yet, but it's in the, um, the book in more detail, is a BAS model. All a BAS model does it allows you to calculate how fast the product will diffuse. So it actually converts those five factors that I talked about, um, Roger's five factors, as well as some of the people and psychology factors, and it allows you to do a mathematical model to predict how fast the product will diffuse. It also lets you look at the impact of pricing and advertising on diffusion, which can be very helpful before you plan your product launch campaign. So really there's Qualitative is the beginning. Conjoint allows you to design the product. Bass Models allows you to design how fast, or understand how fast it'll diffuse, and set your pricing and advertising for the fastest diffusion. So that really completes this section on chapter six, which was about offerings, innovation and offering, and how to build sustainable competitive advantage using an offering. Marketing really plays two roles. They play a role in the development of it, in having a product that best fits customer needs, as well in the launch of a product in order to have it launch and diffuse to the market quickly. That's it, thank you.